Hey everyone, welcome to this week's video edition of Upstream Ag Insights. Um, this is actually about my fifth take, so I was actually going to do this a little bit different and break things out into separate, uh, smaller uh, editions, but just from a time constraint perspective, it's going to be kind of similar to the last couple of weeks uh, in terms of, of how I go go through this uh, through this video. So hopefully uh, next week I don't run into the same technical uh, or maybe it's just... Uh, uh, ineptitude on, on my end, utilizing some of these digital systems, but uh, um, hopefully can still uh, deliver a, a few interesting tidbits uh, today in, in uh, the video edition. So uh, with that, we're going to go on to uh, the first bit of uh, the topics. Uh, so focus on uh, biologicals and, and sustainability and, and uh, um, move on to some of the digital aspects uh, in the uh, in upstream this week. And so First and foremost, uh, dove into the UPL uh, investor presentation. It was actually from sometime in mid 2021, but uh, have just been more interested in, in some of the biological side of things here lately. And, and UPL actually uh, calls themselves the number one bio uh, organization uh, in the world, from what I understand, uh, from all their uh, uh, literature. And so wanted to dive a little bit deeper into them specifically because uh, if anybody remembers from last week, there was a um, market uh, report that I highlighted that stated basically that about $10.6 billion annually uh, is the size of the biological market in, in agriculture. And, and so with UPL being number one, I thought, hey, you know what, I can dig into this a little bit and maybe find out something interesting. Um, they don't actually break out their um, bio-based business in their 2021 information or documents, but uh, I was actually digging around to, to see an old, uh, find an old announcement that they've actually created a new business unit called uh, Natural Plant Protection Products, I believe, um, or Natural Protection Products. Um, anyways, they uh, actually said in there that the size of their business is about 7% from um, biologicals and, and they're about a $5 billion US annual um, revenue business. And so when you start to break that out, uh, we can actually, uh, we can actually see that the total sales from a biological perspective for them is roughly 350 million annually. And so if we start to look at the uh, size of the market, we can actually see that UPL is about 3.5% of the market uh, annually, which is actually pretty small for being the, the largest. And obviously biologicals is pretty disparate. There's a lot of different players. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to be a biological. We can uh, look at uh, uh, selling biostimulants and bio uh, pesticides. But then if you look at say Novozymes, who actually sells, uh, I think in the billions of dollars of revenue in their egg business, which would be enzymes, which are technically uh, falling into the same sort of category from a biological perspective. And so um, they might actually be a, a very large player when you actually break it out because they have relationships with Bayer and, and uh, numerous other uh, agricultural uh, organizations. And so anyway, it's just more of an, an interesting tidbit there. And so it kind of makes me me wonder, you know, is UPL actually the largest uh, biological based organization in agriculture? Or is that market uh, actually not as big as 10.6 billion? Is it actually five? Is it actually seven? Uh, obviously, those forecasts are imperfect by a, a lot of measures. Um, so kind of uh, interesting uh, tidbit there. Started to look at some of their um, business in, in general and, and how they've grown in terms of uh, they were a post patent business. So kind of a generic selling business until they acquired uh, Arista, who has, you know, Fucarbazone and Group 2 and, and Clethodim and actives like that. Um, they uh, um, have grown uh, to be more predominantly what they call differentiated and sustainable solutions. So uh, having proprietary products with a, a bio a bent to them, and they've grown to 29% of their revenue being in that category of differentiated and sustainable. Um, they're trying to target about 50-50. So um, by 2025, they want to be 50% differentiated and sustainable. And so um, pretty, uh, pretty impressive growth there. And for an organization that is um, traditionally post patent, that's a, a pretty cool growth. They're only putting about 2%, uh, maybe a shade over 2% um, annually in terms of their percentage of revenue into R&D. So that's very small when you compare to the, say the other big six organizations, the Corteva, Bayer, BASF, Syngenta, FMC. Um, so uh, in order for them to continually 
improve and, and grow in this space. Um, they've actually taken their open egg approach. So really this kind of um, backwards facing model, so to speak, where, um, you know, they're, in their words, they, they start to from the, the farmer's problems and then kind of work backwards from that and have this open uh, based infrastructure where they're, they're really trying to attract startups and, and organizations to, to come and, and uh, hopefully build uh, products and uh, capabilities from there, which I, I think is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Even Bayer's doing something along those lines on the uh, chemistry front that they recently announced. And so just a, a interesting business when you start to look at, at UPL and and I know from uh, being a, a Canadian and really focusing in on the, the North American businesses, um, you know Arista or sorry UPLs not a significant player in in these markets. Whereas you go into Asia where the the primary uh, aspect or the the biggest uh, aspect of their business is, is located there. They're pr- focusing a, a lot more more there, and it'll be interesting to kind of see how they they really progress and. I know that really leads me into the the last comment on on UPL is uh, they actually announced this week uh, that Mike Frank is coming in as as president and and uh, chief operating officer. Uh, he was previously uh, CCO or chief commercial officer at Monsanto. Uh, then in 2017 uh, went to be CEO of Nutrient Egg Solutions, so the largest uh, egg retailer in the world. And and what I actually found interesting about uh, one slide there uh, in their presentation was this emphasis of the on the channel platform and, and saying how it allows farmers to order inputs online, that sort of thing. Um, you know, when you look at um, some of the other digital aspects that they're really trying to to launch as well or getting into uh, drone spray applications. Um, getting into just more more technology and, and really trying to be um, a, a tech enabled organization, uh, you look at the number of executives in agriculture uh, that have experience at scale of deploying a really extensive uh, technology uh, strategy. Mike Frank's probably the best or the most experienced uh, out there. And so pretty interesting uh, and beneficial uh, acquisition uh, from a talent perspective on on the UPL end. Um, definitely something that I, I think uh, will be interesting to watch. I, I think, uh, I know, I look at it just uh, uh, in terms of um, where Mike's been in, in the past, and, and uh, it seems to me like uh, this role is, is really setting him up to uh, eventually uh, succeed and, and be the, the CEO of the organization over time. And so uh, I think this will be really, really interesting to watch and, and uh, really just an interesting organization to, to follow here in the, the next several years. Um, with that, we'll move on next to the uh, Kula Bio raise. Uh, so they raised 50 million in a Series A round, and really they're a, a bacteria-based organization. Uh, they have a um, patented process that essentially supercharges uh, the Xanthobacter autotrophicus uh, bacteria. So this relatively common uh, bacteria that can actually fix nitrogen or support uh, the delivery of nitrogen to non-nitrogen fixing crops like corn and wheat, et cetera. And, uh, and so super, uh, super compelling uh, these days. Uh, there's been a number of other organizations and I'll touch on that in a second that, that have been focused on this, but what really uh, was the most compelling to me is, uh, or really the most interesting, is uh, if you followed any of their uh, investors on Twitter, they were very active in, in talking about how um, Kula is going to uh, turn the lights out on uh, Haber Bosch factories, and and uh, you know I think that's a little bit of a little bit grandiose and exaggerative of of, uh, of uh, what's going on here, but uh, you know I, I, it's good to to have a name, I suppose. Um, but uh, um, the reality is that it's probably not going to be, especially in the short, medium term, just bacteria or just synthetic. It's going to be a, a combination. There's going to be uh, probably some methods in the uh, from CRISPR and from different uh, genetic modification mechanisms to uh, help with nitrogen use efficiency. I think there's going to be a number of ways that we uh, decrease the uh, synthetic nitrogen use, but we're still going to rely on on synthetic nitrogen for some time, at least from my from my perspective. Um, Especially when you start to look at, um, it's easy to talk about shutting the lights off on the Haber Bosch method, for example. But uh, you know, if you go look at Kula Bio, and I haven't been able to get any actual information from them on this yet, is how much N can they actually fix? What percentage of of N are they able to deliver to a corn crop? So if you have a 180 bushel corn crop, if you have a 50 bushel wheat crop, how much N can actually be delivered to that? How does that change and differ? 
based on uh, geography, based on soil type, based on weather conditions, based on other products being used. And so starts to um, make you wonder, uh, you know, what, what exactly uh, is it? Because that comes down to, because uh, that is important in terms of actually moving moving the needle forward. Uh, you look at some of the best players on the market today, um, the Pivot Bios, the Sound Agriculture, the Simborg, they're all kind of fixing in that 15 to 45 pound an acre range. Uh, something along those lines is kind of where they, they claim and where they talk. Um, you know, it'd be great to see see a hundred um, that sort of number, um, but I don't know if we're going to be there in the next two or three years or anything. I think it's going to take some time or maybe some very big breakthroughs. And so it would be interesting to see where uh, the Kula product actually falls in terms of fixing uh, nitrogen, and then how much does it cost to actually access that? And and so really uh, will be interesting. But I think there's there's definitely uh, going to be these sorts of biological based products in the marketplace. And, and, uh, you know, I've been excited about them for, for a while. And I think it's encouraging that we're seeing them, them on the market. And uh, it really will be um, interesting to watch uh, as this progresses. So interested to hear a little bit more about Kula moving forward, but uh, we'll be watching them along with the, the pivot bios and, and the sound agricultures, not just because of where nitrogen prices and fertilizer prices are this year, but really just because you start to look at the amount of, uh, the amount of operational needs that are uh, driven by synthetic nitrogen on farm. You look at the cost it takes up for farmers. It's it's really a huge, huge opportunity. I know everybody tends to come at it from the the climate and environmental side of things. The the agronomist in me just can't shake the the economics and the benefits to the farmer uh, from that perspective. And and so I really like that aspect. And you know, having that uh, environmental aspect is is uh, just a, another great addition, of course, too. So really cool um raise something to to pay attention to here moving forward um next sustainability which this is really stemming from uh, uh, an article from uh, Farm Journal, which I thought was really well done. Uh, this uh, was an interview with the uh, president uh, Brett Bergman of um, of Winfield United, and uh, he had a few great quotes in in this one. I actually really enjoyed reading this this article. I highly encourage everybody to check it out. Um, he says uh, one that stood out to me, though, based on kind of my my uh, mantra of you know everything starts with the soil or so soil is a starting point. Um, this one quote really uh, stood out to me uh, from him, and uh, we used to, and so he says, we used to say it starts with seed, but it starts with soil. That's the greater purpose. That's the livelihood for the grower. If it doesn't start with the soil, you're missing a step. And so it's actually resonated with me for two reasons. The first, because I'm very adamant about that, that soil uh, being a starting point, but the starting with seed uh, from a retail perspective, being an agronomist that was in retail for the majority of my career, um, that's really the seed aspect is why I started to look at the soil uh, so in depth uh, 10 years ago. And uh, I can tell a little story that I went into in, in Upstream actually, where um, essentially I started to look at soil because I needed a, a crutch because I was uh, having challenges actually selling seed and having challenges uh, differentiating the conversation around seed. And so the reason for that is you know, if you look at the retail selling cycle, traditionally, and this is what Brett's alluding to, is traditionally you get into that fall, like your August, September, October timeframe, and that leadoff conversation tends to be uh, selling of seed. And so that's the initial conversation, but really you're, you're kind of different as a retailer or a seed salesperson. You know, a lot of the seed is very, very similar. You know, you might have 3% gain here, you might have 4% there. Um, you might have a slightly different disease package. You might have a slightly better lodging capability, all very important, don't get me wrong, but it's really hard to have a differentiating conversation as an agronomist, as a retailer uh, versus the, the competitor down the road, because those are pretty simple and constrained parameters to have a conversation about uh, with a farmer. And so you can only add so much value there. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people that do and do it very, very well, but, uh, it was tougher specifically for me as a young agronomist, uh, coming out of university, um, being told, Hey, you know what, go sell, go sell seed. And, and, uh, I remember, uh, what really got me going on this was, uh, this one farmer, uh, in Lucky Lake, Saskatchewan, had told me he'd already uh, already purchased his his seed, and I was like, "Oh man, what am I what am I going to do now?" Uh, so I uh, I was like, "Well, I think after that comes 
soil sampling. So I'll talk to this individual about soil sampling and, and uh, he'd only ever done nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium, sulfur kind of testing in the past. And, and I started to talk to him about, Hey, you know, we can actually go a lot more in depth. We can start to understand, you know, let's really dig into your pH. That's important uh, with how it impacts everything else. Let's get some micronutrients tested for, let's look at your base saturations. Uh, let's look at EC all these different things. And uh, he was like, yeah, let's, let's, let's do it. And, and all of a sudden, when those test results came back, I could sit down and have an in-depth conversation about his soil, about these parameters that he'd never had never known were important and had never known how they actually impacted his operation, his profitability, his yield, all these different things. And all of a sudden, you're the person delivering that information to him, having that conversation, not trying to be like, hey, you know what, this variety over here is 3% higher yielding, you need to try it, it's going to cost you an extra 10 bucks uh, a bag or whatever it comes down to. It was, hey, you know what, here's some of the things going on in your soil that you own, that you're putting seed and putting hundreds of dollars an acre into every single year. Let's make sure we understand it. And so, um, that conversation led to uh, some unique blends on his flax and, and canola fields. And uh, really, that started to get into some blends that were with uh, semi-exclusive products as a, as a retailer. Um, and as a retailer, obviously, you're really trying to add value to that customer and that farmer first and foremost. You want to understand them. You want to make sure you know their pain points, their problems. And then you want to be able to support them with products that are a fit for their operation that are going to help them make money. But of course you want to make sure that there's differentiation and margin in there for yourself as a, as a retailer too. And there was products that uh, I had at this independent retail that I worked at uh, from Mosaic. So their micro essentials, as said, S15 line that were all of a sudden differentiated. I could talk about them now because I knew what was going on in his soil. Um, they were unique to us and they had higher margin built in. And so I could really make sure that he was getting what he needed some zinc on his flax, for example, as, as one specific uh, there, um, but also differentiate myself in the conversation I was having. But then what I didn't realize is that this continued on throughout the rest of the uh, uh, growing season. So we get into the actual uh, seeding time and you're talking about making sure that, you know, seed safety is, is on point. Then you're getting into the herbicide side of things. And that's an opportunity to, again, talk about tissue testing, to talk about micronutrient needs or fertility needs, uh, or sorry, I should say nutrition needs, uh, in season, again, differentiate conversation where everybody else is trying to talk purely about how do I eliminate kochia or, or wild oat, which were weeds that were pretty big in that area at the time. Um, you know, you're talking about more than that. And you're talking about how do we really amplify uh, your yield and not just protect against some of this downside. And so unique there. Um, and uh, really that helped build a much better relationship and understanding. But then what that did in the fall again, so I'm talking a year later now, all of a sudden that farmer came to me to talk about seed because they knew that, hey, you know what? We've already talked about all these other dynamics. We know now that how some of the uh, uh, nitrogen aspects influence our lodging. And so now we're not just talking about standability from a variety perspective. We're talking about it in conjunction with the nutrition package, nitrogen needs, all these different things. And so it becomes a really holistic uh, approach. And so to me, that's where the starting with soil really stemmed from was a crutch because I, I didn't have a better way to, to sell anything and, and create a, a relationship with a farmer. So um, it started as a crutch, but then as you start to dig deeper in, you start to understand how important the soil is for, um, you know, really influencing um, water infiltration, water use efficiency. Um, there's all the environmental and the soil health and the biological aspects. And so you really see where this all, all stems from. And this is where I think Brett's actually going uh, to take it back to the actual article itself that I'm, I'm kind of highlighting is all of a sudden, if you understand the soil and you're starting with the soil, you can have a conversation about carbon. You can have a conversation about sustainability. You're really ingrained in that conversation and that understanding of their, their operation. And, and so I think that's uh, super important. And this is what Brett starts to highlight is the need to have a, what he calls a green strategy. Uh, and that when it comes to sustainability, carbon, green strategy needs in general, it's not going away. And Winfield's very serious about not just talking about the market, but creating and enabling that market and making sure they have the tools and the systems in place to support it longer term. And, and I know there's a lot of apprehension from retailers these days around, um, you know, do I get into carbon? Do I not? Those sorts of things. And, and uh, you know, you can probably argue any way you want, but to me, it's a huge opportunity when you 
really do understand the soil when you're wanting to help your farmers move along. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a selfish, I can I make margin at it, but it can it be supporting that farmer in their operation? And, and I think what uh, he also highlights is some of their digital tools that they have. And, and to me, you can't really have a sustainability or a digital, or sorry, you can't have a sustainability strategy without some of the digital aspects. Uh, and what I mean by that is really you need to have this underpinning of different layers of competency uh, to be able to execute at the, the higher level conversations like sustainability. So you need to have those agronomic fundamentals and education. You need to have the precision offerings. And again, you don't necessarily need to have digital and precision in any certain order. That's just how I put it in here. Um, but then you need to get into the digital side of things where you can actually um, talk about the sensor side of things. You can collect data, you have a place for it. Um, that's where it starts to get into really compelling opportunities with sustainability because uh, sustainability is not as much a definition as it is really being able to understand the practices that are being deployed, why they're being deployed uh, and when to deploy the right ones. And and if that was the right uh, scenario, you if under the specific scenario, were you using the right practice product, et cetera. And so uh, to me, that's really what's interesting is that you need to have these digital capabilities before you can even talk about the, the sustainability side of things. And so I, I view the agronomics, the precision, the digital as underpinnings of sustainability. And, and uh, you know, you start to look at uh, nutrients when talking about this, but you look at this really pointed uh, emphasis from Winfield and and I think it illustrates that this is something that uh, is worth paying attention to and even if you don't see sustainability being a, a big thing it's hard to argue that being strong agronomically having a strong precision offering being in the digital space how that's not going to be good for you longer term and if you can do that well you can really uh, expand into that green or that sustainability uh, initiatives moving forward and so um, I think that really all just meshes together uh, very, very nicely in, in my opinion. And so great article. There's some other good quotes from Brett in there. So I encourage you to uh, check it out. Um, lastly, on this slide, um, Agora, which is the uh, uh, carbon company owned by Yara, uh, they had a, a highlight of um, that they're targeting a million acres this year. And you'll notice the uh, Bayer, I think, has talked about being on 1.5 or 2 million publicly. Uh, I think Nutrient's something like 200,000. You know, I think Corteva's somewhere in that million plus range. And so anyways, there's lots of buzz about carbon. We hear a ton about it, but it's only, you know, a million here, a million there. There's hundreds of millions of acres in, in the U.S. There's 60, 70 million in, in Canada. So you probably have upwards of, you know, 300 plus million acres um, to touch on. And we're on, you know, we're seeing carbon practices from some of the largest players on a million here and a million there. So it's not, not that large. And when you start to look at it in context, um, you know, Bayer just had a, in one of their, uh, one of their investor presentations, uh, uh, an extend based product that they launched in year one on 15 million acres. Uh, they had a nematode based product that they launched on 8 million acres a couple years ago. Uh, they had, uh, BASF had a product that they launched on 4 million acres. Uh, in Canada, for example, if we were to see a, a product being launched uh, from a variety or a crop protection product, you know, you're probably on 500,000 or one, 1 1.2 million acres, something like that. And, and that's a lot smaller acre base to launch on. And so um, really what I, I mean to, to highlight here is just how small the, the carbon acres are in, in context. And that's not to say it's not important. It will probably ramp up. I agree with Brett on, on where things are, are probably headed. Uh, but I think it's interesting just to put it in the context of how, small in a um, relative basis to how these companies typically launch products and, and move things ahead. And, and I'll be the first to say, it's kind of an unfair comparison in a lot of ways. Um, obviously, a variety, a crop protection product is one product um, being put on acres. You can ramp that up, ramp that down pretty, uh, pretty quickly. Everybody's very good at that if you're launching products uh, regularly. Uh, whereas carbon is a new system, new approach. There's new competencies, new needs, all these different things. So it's, it's not apples to apples by any means, but it's more just, hey, you know what? We're hearing a lot of buzz, but it is still relatively small. Uh, and so, you know what? If you're an organization looking at it, I don't think you're, you know, hooped if you're not uh, on a million acres already, it shows that there's still a, a lot of opportunity to really get a sound plan in place, the right partners, uh, those sorts of things. And so anyways, just an interesting tidbit there. Um, and then lastly, uh, we're going to talk on the digital aspects for the week. And, and uh, I wanted to highlight my, my friends, uh, 
uh, at Tenacious Ventures, their digitally native agriculture article. Uh, I love this concept. I think it's it's great, and and uh, they do a good job of illustrating, you know, how they see it, what they see it as, and um, I'll, I'll highlight one clip from the the article here and. They say agriculture that is dig digitally native operates on the assumption that all required information is available at the highest possible spatial, temporal, and spectral resolution. Decisions no longer need to be framed and constrained by the partitioning established around industrial era infrastructure. Pervasive, inexpensive, high resolution imagery is available for the entire plant every day. Complex statistical and machine learning computer models can use this and many other massive data sets to build increasingly accurate models of the real world. And so really, um, when it comes to digital, you start to eliminate some of these physical and analog based constraints. We can do a lot more in real time. We don't need to have this entire long process to do something. We can eliminate gut feel. We can eliminate bias, not entirely, of course, but uh, uh, there's always going to be bias in, in data and, and digital systems. Uh, but uh, you can eliminate singular uh, person bias uh, for myself making a recommendation. There's always bias there versus somebody else, of course. So kind of interesting and and uh, what this can do for the actual efficiency of the industry what this can do to really deliver better outcomes for the industry uh, is huge and and i always think about this in in kind of how my terms uh um i kind of approach it as digital first mindsets and and really really working to uh eliminate the bias that we have where we grew up with physical or in the physical and the analog world we know that we kind of think where we need to have um, we need to have the actual and what I mean to say is is we tend to to think about things with the bias of the physical world uh, when we're applying digital and so we end up with this Frankenstein-esque kind of approach to things and uh, it really makes me think about um, various other technologies that have came into the world and and I tend to go back to um, things like uh, electricity where uh when electricity was first launched you know it, it took a while to really take on it was kind of looked at as this wealthy person kind of random tool that uh, would light up christmas trees and, and stuff like that but um when uh, the power when we had powered homes instead of having light switches um you actually had to go to the physical light electric light and turn it on so if you walked into a room you still had to go to the light and this was based off of when there was oil and gas uh based uh um fixtures that you had to actually physically light with a, a match you had to walk up to the system light the match and and light the the system to light the room and this never really changed uh until somebody said hey you know what what if we put a light switch so we don't have to go walk to the the center of the room to light this or turn this on uh, we can just flip the switch because electricity actually enables us to do that it can remove us from having to physically walk over there and this same sort of bias we see in in technology and agriculture and, and such all the time and uh, i think it's really an, an interesting uh example of uh how we can start to um remove ourselves from that and and think with a, a digital first mindset and, and what really got me onto this was i was on the the Simpis website and uh they're a group that's uh really cool in in my mind they they kind of have this uh, uh delivery mechanism that that goes onto planters where you can have like a basically it's like cartridge based delivery of crop protection, uh, crop input based products. And so a uh, pretty interesting group out of the, the AMVAC uh, American Vanguard group there. Um, but I was on their website, just kind of playing around and this is nothing against them and them and their website. It's just something that triggered in my mind. And you could actually go on to their website and, and uh, play around with the, the rates and, and the needs. And, and, uh, there's a calculator on there, which is a, a great example of, of, uh, of, um, uh, a tool to to help support farmers that are trying to understand the product. But what I found interesting is uh, there was a print button. And so now you have one of the most cutting edge technologies that can go on a planter that can be used in, in egg tech today. And you go on their website to use the calculator, which is again, a great tool. Um, but now you print it onto a physical piece of paper uh, instead of having a, for one, you could have an export based option where it's like, hey, let's hit the export button and we can email it to our retailer of choice to get a quote or to get insight into what this should look like. Uh, you could extrapolate this out further and how this could connect into different digital portals and, and have APIs into that, but don't even mean to, to go that far. 
And uh, again, just an example of where all of a sudden we can eliminate some of these basic physical things that we, how we think and reinforce it with a digital aspect and a digital capability. And quite frankly, again, this is not something that I'm like, oh, the, what a, what a crazy group at, at Simpus. What I'm, what I'm, they're probably doing is actually looking at it from who their core customer is today. And, and uh, that might be the desire of, of their core customer, but where you can actually start to transition this and move this, uh, I think is a, is a huge, uh, so this is a small opportunity, but just this mindset is something that we can continually progress from. And so I just found that pretty, uh, pretty interesting, and I think consistent uh, in some ways with how the Tenacious Group is thinking about digitally native agriculture. And so, uh, next, uh, FBN direct upgrades, and so um, nothing too big here, but they uh, really started just uh, having a new recommendation tool on their e-commerce website. And so, I'll, I'll quickly read a blip there. Uh, the FBN direct. The FBN Direct online store has recently redesigned to include a recommendation model that highlights recommended adjuvants whenever a crop protection product is added to a user's cart. It is the first of several digital agronomy features coming to the online buying experience with FBN. And so I think this is this is smart. Again, you know, no matter your opinion of, of e-commerce, I think one of the opportunities for uh, really engaging uh, customers and adding value to, to farmers and, and users is really some of these these digital components that can uh, tie in a product that is complementary and supportive of another needed product in your cart as, as it would be called or in the back of the truck I guess is how I think about it from a farming perspective. Um, this is consistent with something that I've seen work successfully and, and have been a part of within retail organizations where when Glyphosate got put into the uh, order, all of a sudden a suggestion around uh, around additional um, crop uh, herbicide, I guess, based products to uh, support tank mixing, to support resistance management, all uh, came up as a suggestion to uh, put in a group 14, uh, those sorts of things. And we actually seen the uh, increase in uh, amount of uh, pre-burn products going in with glyphosate. Uh, so the proportion of sales that um, had an associated uh, tank mix went up because of this reminder. And so basic uh, psychological thing that, that works uh, really, really well. So I think this is smart from, from FBN. Uh, and finally, just quickly, Precision Planting launched some new products and they, they talked about a few different things, but the one thing that was most compelling to me was the camera aspect. So you launch, they, they launched a um, uh, camera-based add-on system and really, uh, this can do a number of things, but what uh, I found to be the most interesting or at least supportive of kind of their core business, because you could get into some of the autonomy aspects. Um, but today, Precision Planting, they offer um, a number of different things that help with planting and, and making your planting experience that much better. Um, the one thing that is important to understand from a planting perspective is what was your mortality? Uh, how's the crop health doing afterwards? Um, really uh, some of these other aspects to see how are their tools um, being used and how are they supporting that that crop? And so what I found uh, to be most most interesting here is that all of a sudden now they can have these really best in class tools and assets to help farmers uh, have better planting experiences, but now they can actually start to quantify that. They can actually start to showcase how that is um, being improved upon, what the numbers are, are coming back as for, for a farmer based on where those cameras could be installed and, and uh, support some of the uh, stand establishment numbers, uh, mortality numbers, all these different things that I, I think can be extremely beneficial. So I think a smart announcement there from, from Precision Planting and, and looking forward to seeing how that, that moves forward uh, for the uh, Precision Planting Group and, and Agco. And so with that, uh, this one got a, a little long. Like I said, this was supposed to be a few different um, a few different uh, videos this week, but uh, due to some technical difficulties and, and time constraints, uh, ended up being a, a, a one-off longer uh, video. So again, next week, going to change things uh, up to what I was intending to this week to have some separate uh, build-outs. But uh, if there's any other suggestions, feel free to send uh, send me a message, comment, um, whatever works best for you. Uh, looking forward to hearing all, all the feedback from everybody uh, and hope everybody has a great week. Thanks.